Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash from New York City. This week in Prophecy, Monday, March 18th, 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Wonderful to be with you here from New York City. This week in Prophecy. This week in Prophecy, we have a number of events in Britain, the Middle East, New Zealand this week, and of course the USA, but let us begin. As we speak, the aftermath of the Islamic terrorist attack in Ariel, effectively a suburb of Tel Aviv, in what we call in Hebrew the Shtichim, the West Bank of the Jordan, uh, took place in which one Israeli was killed and five were injured. At the moment, surgeons are fighting to save the lives of some of the victims. We do pray that they will recover. And our condolences to the family of the victim. Also, as always, we pray that the Lord will use these tragedies to cause Jewish people to seek the truth about their Messiah, Yeshua. Uh, there is no security for anyone and for any Jew just because they're in Israel. Their only security is in the hand of the Messiah, the palm of Yeshua. Nonetheless, another terrorist attack, combining a shooting with a stabbing. I know Ariel very well. There was a horrible attack at a hotel in Ariel at one point with two Islamic suicide bombers blowing themselves up in an attempt to kill Israeli soldiers. Uh, in the Eshel Hashemron Hotel, they essentially blew up the lobby, killing themselves and injuring some of the hotel staff. I know those people very well, and it was horrific, but it could have been much worse. In a Muslim village immediately next to Ariel, no fewer than 10 suicide bombers uh, launched attacks on Israeli targets. Uh, it's a tense area, but it's really a suburb of Tel Aviv. The people who live in Ariel generally drive to work every day in Tel Aviv. The proximity to Tel Aviv is what troubles people the most, but it does not set a precedent that's happened before. This week in prophecy also, two missiles were fired from the Gaza Strip at Tel Aviv. Fortunately, the damage was not significant. However, it prompted an Israeli response. The Israelis retaliated by taking out at least 100 targets in Gaza of mainly Hamas. They did this with fighter aircraft, with helicopters, and with drones in response to these attacks. There was also Israeli counterattacks for further balloon launch incendiary attacks from Gaza this week in prophecy. It's ongoing. These rockets were not aimed at Sderot, but at Tel Aviv. There was some claim that they were fired accidentally. Uh, that may be difficult to believe for some people. On the other hand, we can't write it off. But they were fired from Gaza at the city of Tel Aviv itself, and the Israelis responded. This again raises a further specter. Is Israel potentially facing a conflict in the Golan Heights, in Galilee and the Lebanon border, and in Gaza simultaneously, together with an intifada? This would cause a major major Israeli response. And it could happen. Because this week in prophecy, further Middle East events have been unfolding. Russian manufactured military hardware is being transferred by Iran to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. This armament upbuild in southern Lebanon has in the past precipitated armed conflict with the Israelis. The Iranians are now boasting of their capacity to hit anywhere, any target in Israel, not from Iran, but from either Syria or Lebanon. The Israelis are well aware of this, and the Israelis are preparing for counterattacks. But it has also involved the United States with less media fanfare and coverage. For the first time, American Fa'ad missile systems are deployed to be interactively operated with the Israeli slingshot missiles 
the Israeli Iron Dome missiles and the Israeli Arrow missiles, all anti-ballistic missiles and anti-projectile defense systems. But none of them, none of them operating in the way the American Ta'ad does, which is a terminal high altitude air defense system, the most advanced in the world. Nothing that Russia has comes near it. But the fact that the United States is deploying it in Israel and training together with Israelis for its use in a combat situation is, again, not an event that is not significant. These things are beginning to play up and heat up. At the same time this week in prophecy, Assad visited Tehran to pay homage to his Iranian supporters, President Assad of Syria. The Syrians, of course, see this as part of a religious crusade, as well as the Iranian ambition to extend Iran's control into Iraq, into Lebanon, and into Syria. What Iran essentially wishes to do is what ISIS wished to do with its caliphate. Only ISIS was Sunni. Iran is Shia. Having natural allies in Hezbollah and in the Alawite Muslim regime of Assad and of Syria, and the large uh, Shia population in southern Iraq, south of Baghdad, in the area of the Sha'at al Arab. This Iranian ambition has placed the United States in a difficult position. Things are happening that are being ignored or underreported as usual by the media. First of all, Iran is pressuring the Iraqi government of Adel Mahdi to demand the removal of American forces from Iraq. As we remember, the American siege of General Petraeus worked. Uh, the militants were defeated, but the Obama administration seized defeat from the jaws of victory, pulling out the American forces prematurely, leaving a vacuum which was filled by ISIS, which he mocked as a JV team two weeks before they began attacking targets in Paris, Brussels, Germany, and San Bernardino, California. This was Barack Obama's foreign policy in Iraq. The Trump administration has responded by increasing American troop presence. But something else has happened. The Iranian foreign minister, the Iranian oil minister, and the Iranian president, Rouhani, arrived in Iraq this week in prophecy for negotiations of a political nature following the financial and economic negotiations between the Central Bank of Iraq and the Central Bank of Iran to sell Iranian oil via Iraq as if it were Iraqi oil being exported. The Iranian strategy is to use Iraq as a way to circumvent the American embargo on Iran and the American blocking of the processing of petrol dollars from Iran through the American financial system. The United States has responded, Mr. Pompeo, the Secretary of State, threatening a cessation of American financial aid to Iraq, which is important to their economic sustenance. Iran is in too much trouble itself economically to provide much help, and what money it does have is going to terror and the military. But also, the Trump administration has made it clear to Iraq that if Iraq makes itself a vehicle to bust the American embargo on Iran, that Iraq itself will face blockage in the American financial system and its capacity to process petrol dollars. The situation is very tenuous. A number of people have said something that was rather crude, but people said it, and they said it this way. Saddam Hussein was an SOB, 
sorry to put it that way, but that's what they said. I'm simply quoting them. The problem was he was not our SOB. Saddam Hussein was a tyrant. What he did at Halabja to the Turkish, I'm sorry, to the uh, Kurdish women and children using biological weapons to kill between four and 5,000 was unspeakable. His human rights violations, his funding of terror, all of these things are true. But he was a buffer against Iran. Let us not forget that the West supported Iraq against Iran in the Iraq-Iran war that killed 1.5 million Muslims, killing each other. This went on until the invasion of Kuwait. He was no longer the West's quote-unquote agent or, as people said, SOB. Again, I apologize for the reference to the vulgar colloquialism, but that's what was being said. We have pointed out a number of times the only way to stabilize Iraq in a manner that will be favorable to most of the people in Iraq, that will be favorable to the interests of the West, including the United States, Israel, and Europe, is to have a Turkish regime running Iraq, or a Turkish state controlling from Kirkuk up unto Turkey, even though the Turkish would very much object to this, particularly the Erdogan regime inside Turkey. We have said repeatedly the only people who the West and the United States and Israel can trust in Iraq at all are the Kurds. The Bush administration, the Obama administration have treated the Kurds shamefully. The Kurds are afraid they're going to get the same treatment from the Trump administration, although that has not happened yet. Some of them are beginning to friendly up to Assad out of fear. The Turks have stood with the United States against the Russian-backed Syrian threat. They have stood with the United States against ISIS. They don't like Erdogan, obviously, in Turkey. They have absolutely no common ground in the ambitions of Iran to create a Shia caliphate from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, into Lebanon. None. None. Something has got to happen in Iraq. We cannot trust the Mahdi government. Mr. Trump inherited the failed policies of Barack Obama. Barack Obama inherited the failed policies of George W. Bush. But now the Trump administration must cope with these realities, the Iranian ambition and Iran's desire to get control of Iraq and to use Iraq as a staging point to circumvent the American embargoes. This is what is happening this week in prophecy. People are talking about many things this week in prophecy, but not about the most important things. This week in prophecy, it was formally disclosed what we had announced weeks ago. The armament of Hezbollah, now with official Russian participation. These dialogues that have been taking place between Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Putin have not achieved very much, maybe some things, but in the long term, not. We try to avoid the rambunction of saying there's going to be a Gog and Magog explosion or a Gog and Magog scenario in the near future. On the other hand, we've never denied the possibility of that happening either. But what we can say is something is happening. Iraq being sandwiched between Syria and Iran and Syria being sandwiched between Lebanon and Iraq. Something must give. The Iranians are on the warpath. 
as we've said, desperate people do desperate things. Their economy is very, very precarious and getting worse by the day. They have to find a mechanism to deal with Mr. Trump's reactions to them. Iraq is the key to them. Iraq is the story. But let us move on this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Fox News has taken the politically correct line again. I personally am of the opinion that Fox News is the best of a bad bunch or a lesser of evils or the closest thing to fair and balanced as an alternative to CNN, to the BBC, to MSNBC, to the networks. It's not as bad as they are, and some of the people on Fox have been traditionally good. But politics has again, unfortunately, prevailed in the Murdoch dynasty. Rupert being so old now, his sons are running more and more of the enterprise, and their policies are not always in line with what his policies had been in the past. We are also reminded of the heavy investment in Fox, though not controlling interest by any means, of the Saudi Kingdom Fund, controlled or had, which had been managed by Bin Talal Al Sud, uh, Al Tawid Bin Talal Al Sud. Uh, again, a funder of fundamentalist Islamic education, mosques, and political activities, fostering the spread of Salafism and uh, Wahhabism internationally, particularly in Africa. Could this be a factor in what Fox has done? I do not know, but what they've done is this. They've suspended Judge Janine Pirro. President Trump has rightly protested this and urged others to do the same. She simply pointed out something that we had said, that this Congresswoman, Omar, making anti-Semitic statements certainly the anti-Zionist statements. Wearing a hijab in accordance with the Quran's teaching in Surah 33, verse 59, would give indication she subscribes to Sharia, a religious legal system, not there just for purposes of religion, but which is believed by its proponents should be imposed even on non-Islamic countries. Many Muslims have said this. Judge Shapiro questioned this woman's right to have immigrated to the United States from Mogadishu. Is her loyalty to the American Constitution or to Sharia? Certainly, an anti Semite or any bigot should not be in Congress, but she is. The question of her loyalty to the United States is a fair one as is the loyalty of Tliab, who danced with the Palestinian flag upon election, as we pointed out in previous weeks in prophecy. But Fox has suspended her. We urge our viewers to protest to Fox. It's not fair. Nonetheless, there is an alternative to Fox. Uh, Sinclair Broadcasting, One America has continued to grow steadily, and it is what Fox pretends to be. Now, again, we respect Laura Ingram and Sean Hannity and his views, and then Tucker Carlson, I'm not saying everyone on Fox is bad. By any means, they're not. But the senior management is not free of political correctness. It may not be as unprincipled as the other major news agencies. But it's not highly principled either. This mistreatment of Judge Janine Shapiro is frankly outrageous. Her comments were well in order. 
They were not bigoted. They were honest. But let's move on. What we are seeing in this regard is a division within the left itself among the Democrats. Bill and Hillary Clinton have tried to groom their daughter, Chelsea, for a political career, at one time proposing that she could possibly run for Congress. Her husband is Jewish. She's the mother of half-Jewish children. She made a public statement against the anti-Semitic remarks of Ilan Omar from the House of Representatives, condemning the anti-Semitic nature of Omar's antics. A contingent of left-wing students protested Chelsea Clinton this week in prophecy, accusing her of fueling attacks in New Zealand at the mosques simply because she denounced anti-Semitism in the House of Representatives. She's accused of fueling what happened in New Zealand. Chelsea Clinton was confronted by uh, an NYU student at a vigil for those killed in New Zealand this weekend uh, over the way that she, Chelsea Clinton, had condemned recent comments from Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Take a listen to this confrontation. After all that you have done and all this on the that you have so I'm so sorry. Well, certainly, it was never my intention. This right here is the result of a massacre stoked by people like you and the words that you put out into the world. And I want you to know that and I want you to feel that deep inside. 49 people died because of the rhetoric that you put out there. I don't know if you could hear that. Um, it's a, a video that's gone pretty viral. But basically, this NYU student is saying that because Chelsea Clinton confronted uh, Ilhan Omar, Congresswoman Omar, in the way she did, uh, that the massacre uh, is partly her fault. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, I'm wondering what your response is. Well, I just know, I know, you know, Congresswoman Omar and myself have gotten so many death threats. I think she is probably um, really, I, I, actually pray every day for her safety. I can just tell you the kind of public disagreement and the kind of language that sometimes is being used towards disagreeing with her on a number of fronts, foreign policy issues. People need to be very careful. Uh, she's become very much a target. And right after not only the West Virginia you know, poster putting her face there with the 9-11 towers in the background, um, this is a woman that is a mother, that is an American, that is serving her country. And we need to be very careful when we disagree publicly, when we disagree publicly on various policy agreements, we have to be very careful in the language that we use. And I can tell you, uh, look, I have seen the letters and have seen the various posts from not only Democrat, from Republicans, but also Democrats, that when we target or, or disagree, we need to be very careful and that it's not feeding into the Islamophobia that is growing in our country. Now, of course, this is ridiculous. It's absurd. But it does demonstrate how the left is divided against itself, how the traditional Democratic Party is largely gone. It is the domain of the extreme left. Only 21% of Democrats are pro-Israel, as opposed to 83% of Republicans and well over 90% of independent conservatives. Yet, in unbelievable naivete, in unbelievable self-harming ignorance, the majority of New York's liberal Jewish community and Californians are still Democrat. Again, I've compared these people before to a pathetic figure who would pay their own train fare to Auschwitz. What are they doing in a party that gives platform and outlet and political office to Alain Omar, 
and to Tliab. How can any Jew vote for them? I used to ask, how can any Afro-American person vote for the political party of segregation of Jim Crow and slavery, specifically the Democrats? How can a black person vote Democrat? Well, now I'm asking, how can a Jew vote Democrat? How can a Jew vote Democrat? It's almost an irrational blindness has come upon these people that they can't see or won't see what's happening. As we've already lamented, the silence and inaction and compromise of Senator Blumenthal, the stolen valor culprit, of Chuck Schumer, of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, where are they? Why are they not speaking out? Why don't they stop this woman? Why do they let Pelosi put her as a junior member of Congress on a major committee involved in foreign relations and overseeing American foreign policy? Somebody who makes overt anti-Semitic statements in the opinion of most people. But it's happening this week in prophecy. We see the left devouring itself. We see the Democrats turning against each other. And notice, it's the place of Israel and the Jews that are the central issue. God is going to force the Jews out of the Democratic Party by letting it be taken over by the extreme left. Or they will pay the price for their unbelievable stupidity. Now, I'm not speaking of all Jews. Thank God for Mark Levin, for Michael Savage, for David Horowitz. Thank God for the Jews who understand and know the truth. Thank God for the Afro-Americans who know the truth. Professor Walter Williams, Dr. Thomas Sowell, Dr. Alan Keyes, Dr. Ben Carson, Herman Cain. Thank God for the Afro-Americans who see through the political charade and the manipulation. But most blacks are taken for a ride and most Jews are riding on the same bus, or I should say train. And we know where the train is once again bound for. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, in the Israeli elections, the blue and white party, led by Benny Gantz, the opponent of Benjamin Netanyahu, has gone into a political mini crisis in the weeks before the election when it was disclosed his iPhone was hacked by Iranian intelligence inside of Israel. Now, the Israeli counterintelligence, the Shin Bet, was good enough to intercept it and prevent any classified information from going to Iran. But the information they did obtain was sensitive and put him in a dangerous position. This could be tipping public opinion towards Benjamin Netanyahu simply out of fear that Mr. Gantz is not up to the job in terms of national security at a time when a threat to Israel again looms in both Gaza, in Lebanon, and in the Golan with Iran pulling most of the strings. It will have some kind of political impact on the election. Meanwhile, the Israeli Supreme Court has outlawed Otsma the political party that is the heir to the Kach party, known in the United States as the JDL, the Jewish Defense League, founded by late Rabbi Meir Kahane. It may be noble to do that. Otsma certainly hates Jewish believers in Jesus. They certainly are not simply Jewish nationalists, 
but intolerant and racist, in the opinion of most Israelis. However, the Israeli Supreme Court allowed two extreme left-wing anti-Zionist, anti-Israel Arab parties to remain legal parties and electoral participants. Nobody can fault them for outlawing Otsuba. But why are there two standards? Why will they outlaw militant Jews, but not anti-Zionist, extreme left-wing parties controlled by mainly Islamists? This Week in Prophecy. This Week in Prophecy, the British Parliament has essentially put itself into opposition with the British people. Rejecting Theresa May's latest effort for a Brexit deal with the unelected European socialist bureaucracy. Parliament voted that they will not support leaving on the 29th of May as scheduled without a deal. Thus trying to dismiss, negate what the British voters opted for. Parliament versus the people. This can result in one of three possibilities. The first is what the British establishment wants. The British establishment is like the American swamp. The Republican Party establishment, such as the Bush dynasty, establishment Republicans, Slime Incorporated, and the Democrats, the six of one half dozen of the other, as we said repeatedly. Again, I don't say that in terms of electoral campaigning. I'm simply saying it as a opinion. Neither one are really pro-life. Neither one are in any way really even pro-American in many respects. Well, you've got the same thing in Israel, but you've got the same thing in Britain. The Tory party establishment is largely controlled by Europhiles, not by conservatives. They will join with Labour against Britain and against the British people to try to force another referendum. They're going into what on the other side of the Atlantic is called Irish politics. In the Republic of Ireland, when the Doyle, the Irish Parliament, puts things to public referendum for decision, if the public decision is not what they want, they hold another referendum until they eventually get what they want. This is Irish politics. Well, it's now becoming British politics, unless there is a hard Brexit. The other possibility that the people did not opt for is to extend the British date of formally leaving. There have been all kinds of threats, predictions of financial and economic disaster. But again, this is the establishment scaremongering. This is the same as we saw in the United States. If Mr. Trump is elected, all these bad things are going to happen. Did they happen? No, things have by and large improved in both foreign and economic policy, apart, of course, from the deficits. Big factor, but not peculiar to Mr. Trump. But, but let's move on. What will happen? The best would be for a hard Brexit with Great Britain negotiating with the Republic of Ireland a separate taxation, customs, and excise agreement. That would be the best. 
who would be the best for Britain and for Ireland. But the establishment doesn't want it. They just don't want it. The media is the voice of the establishment, much the same as the mainstream media in the United States is the voice of Slime Incorporated, of the swamp rats who want to perpetuate the corrupt status quo to the detriment of the nation and to the undermining of the popular will of the majority of the electorate. But let's keep a careful eye on Britain. Theresa May, a very weak prime minister who, as we said multiple times, not being Brexit, should never have been in number 10 Downing Street, is. Jeremy Corbyn, a vehement enemy of Israel, a left-wing socialist, much the same as a left-wing socialist controlling the Democratic Party increasingly now in the United States, is demanding a general election, thinking they can win. And with a weak leader like Theresa May, he may be right. There is a tremendous political battle, but on back of it, I believe a spiritual battle. Much the same as these events with Iran come straight from the book of Daniel, chapter 10 in the Middle East. These events you see surrounding Brexit and underlying the Brexit debate come straight from the book of Daniel chapters seven and eight, but let's press on this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Russian intelligence, FSB, have stated that close to the former border with the Soviet Union, the ISIS forces displaced mainly by the United States and its allies and partners from Iraq and Syria are now congregating in northern Afghanistan. It is not just Taliban, it is not just Al-Qaeda, but in the area of Daesh in northern Afghanistan, ISIS is attempting to establish a new home. This could impede the withdrawal of American and NATO forces from Afghanistan further that Mr. Trump has desperately wanted to extract the United States from. We know what happens when terrorists become embedded in Afghanistan. That is how September 11th happened. Yes, the United States used the Taliban to get back, to retaliate against the Soviet Union for the Soviet support of North Vietnam. So the Americans and the West did to the Soviets in Afghanistan what the Soviets did to the Americans in Southeast Asia. But what were you left with? What were you left with? That's what's happening this week in prophecy. That mess in Afghanistan seems almost insoluble. There is a way it could end, other than, of course, nuclear conflict. But the way would not be a pleasant one. Famine has struck northern Afghanistan before. If starvation was used as a military weapon, you could kill enough of those people off by starvation. Russia tried such things, and they have tried it on each other. In the past, a complete famine was averted by Western, particularly American, food aid. The United States would need to say, you stop supporting ISIS, you stop supporting the Taliban and we'll feed you. But no food aid if you want to fight. Fair exchange. Again, it was Mengitsu in Ethiopia 
who used starvation as a military weapon against his own people. It was Joseph Stalin who used starvation as a military weapon against his own people. I do not want to weaponize food. You can love your enemies, you can feed your enemies, but not while they're trying to kill you. Not where they're trying to support terror. There has to be a condition. We'll be nice to you if you stop being wicked to us. That, of course, presupposes another major food shortage. But a food shortage at some point is probably inevitable in Afghanistan, including northern Afghanistan, especially the tribal mountain regions. But it's taking place this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the first details were disclosed about the shooter in New Zealand who attacked two mosques with the death count now reaching 50 dead Muslims. His name is Brenton Harris Parent. What is known about him? The left in the United States and Europe have attempted to blame everyone from Chelsea Clinton to Donald Trump for what this person did. Misrepresenting his actual motives. This person traveled internationally to a number of countries, including Muslim countries like Pakistan and even North Korea, communist countries. He stated that the country that best reflects his ideals and policies is communist China. He is not a right-wing figure. He is a left-wing figure. The mainstream media the academic left have attempted to identify Islamophobia, as they call it, or racism, as they call it, or anti-immigration policies, as they call it, with right-wing extremism. This is absurd. This person, Mr. Tarrant, was not a Kiwi, New Zealand patriot, concerned of the invasion of his country by radical Muslims while the New Zealand government twiddled their thumbs and allowed it to happen. That was not the story. That was the true one. No, he was not a patriot concerned about the influx of radical Muslims into New Zealand and trying to defend his country in his thinking. New Zealand is not his country. He is an Australian, he's an Aussie, he's not a Kiwi. That's to begin with. So he's not a Kiwi patriot. He's not a Kiwi. He's Australian. The idea that he was defending his country against Islamic invasion and this, this is nonsense. It's not his country. Secondly, he was not a right-wing extremist. His political identity and ideology was congruous with Red China, so he says. There is tons of material that was gleaned from the internet and social media concerning him and his ideological background. Contrary to what the left propagates, by far the most genocidally extreme expressions of ethnic cleansing have not been by right-wing people. Joseph Stalin massively exterminated the Ukrainians. 
Stalin was a socialist. Adolf Hitler was a Nazi. The National Socialist Workers Party. Stalin and Hitler were both socialists. Both. It is the political left that is the most bigoted and racist, as we see in the American Congress now, with Alain Omar, the congresswoman. She's from the left. This misidentity of ethnic hatred with the political right, ignoring that the most astronomical of genocidal crimes against humanity were perpetrated by socialists and by the political left and are still being generated from the left, from the American Congress to New Zealand. It's always been the case. Let us continue looking at this. A number of years ago, I warned, and I was not the only one, but I certainly warned that if Western governments, particularly in Europe and in Britain, but also the United States and Australia and New Zealand, if they failed to stop the immigration of fundamentalist Muslims. I'm not talking about secular Muslims, moderate Muslims. I'm talking about those who are pro-Sharia and have an agenda to impose Sharia on the countries to which they immigrate. Those who carried out the Cronulla riots in Sydney and the Bandler riots in Paris, who wanted to kill a British citizen, Salman Rushdie, for publishing a book in his own country. The perpetrators of the San Bernardino attacks. These people should never have been allowed to immigrate into Western countries. And by opening the doors to them, our corrupt leaders, people like the Bush family, owned and operated by the House of Saud in their administration, and others who gave open immigration, Angela Merkel. By them doing this, I warned, that they were going to force people in desperation to gravitate to political extremist parties. I don't mean realistic nationalists like Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage in Great Britain, or Donald Trump in the USA, or Geert Wilders in Holland. I mean things like the British National Party, or others who are really, really hate-driven people. Unless there is a end to immigration of fundamentalist Muslims into the Western world who are coming, who are practicing forced marriages, who are responsible for the sexual enslavement in Rotherham, England, who riot in Paris, in Sydney. Unless there is a ban on this kind of Islamic immigration until we have a way to vet immigrants from Islamic countries separating the extremists from the moderates. The extremists are going to get in and you can only push people so far for so long. Even the most moderate the most left-wing of countries, the most tolerant, for want of a better expression or description, such as Sweden. People are getting fed up. The failure of Western governments to stand up to fundamentalist Islamic immigration. We're not speaking against moderate Muslims. 
but we are speaking against those who believe in the fomentation and promotion of Sharia in Western countries. Unless they are stopped, unless the United States government asks the question, why is CAIR allowed to exist when three of its officials were unindicted co-conspirators in the funding of terror surrounding September 11th in those investigations, according to the American Justice Department. Why is that organization allowed when there are Muslim countries who consider it, Muslim countries who consider it to be a terror organization? Just because of the oil whores, such as the Bush dynasty. willing to turn their back on persecuted Christians in order to placate financial interests representing petro wealth. That happened. I know moderate Muslims, but a moderate Muslim and a fundamentalist Muslim are two different things. The biggest victims of fundamentalist Muslims are usually moderate ones. Yes, they kill Christians, they kill Jews, but they kill moderate Muslims. Moderate Muslims are regularly intimidated in Britain and in Europe by the radical ones who Western governments have allowed into Western countries. Why are these Islamic refugees from Mogadishu like Omar, why aren't they going to Islamic countries? Their own people don't want them. The Emirates and the Gulf states won't take them. Why should you dump your garbage in the United States or the United Kingdom? Am I calling them garbage? No, but the other Arab Muslim countries who don't want them treat them like garbage. If their own kind don't want them, what do their own kind know that we don't? Why are we taking them when their own kind won't even let them in? We are going to see more and more people driven to taking matters into their own hands and defending themselves against fundamentalist Islam. I do not wish to see mosques shot up the way churches are shot up in Muslim countries. I don't want to see that happen. But unless Western governments stand up to this issue and face the fact that fundamentalist Muslims are not moderate, that people like Omar should never have been given a visa to come to the United States. When a British soldier is hacked to death on the streets of Greenwich, England, when British troops killed in combat coming home in coffins are mocked and booed, when their remains are repatriated to Britain by Muslim gangs, the Bradford riots, people are getting fed up. More of this is going to happen. People will be driven to extremism. If their government won't defend them, they'll defend themselves. I do not want that to happen. This person, Tarrant, was an anti-Semite. He was ideologically pro-Chinese communist. He was a racist. I have no time for people like him. I don't have any more respect for someone like him than I do for Omar. They're six of one, half dozen of the other. We're going to see more of this happening in the future, unless the issue 
of radical Islamic immigration is addressed. Mr. Trump has tried. The idiot left has blocked him. But this person's parent is from the idiot left. The biggest genocidal killers in the world, the biggest ethnic cleansers have been socialists. They've been people from that persuasion. Omar is on the left. Stalin, Hitler, and socialists. The hypocrisy, the confusion, and the inevitability. This will only get worse if governments do not take a stand. They need to listen to Mr. Trump. They need to listen to Mr. Vilders. They need to listen to Nigel Farage. We need to protect moderate Muslims, Christians, and Jews from these barbarians. We should not be giving them visas to come into civilized countries when Muslim countries don't want them, and rightly so. What happened in New Zealand is going to happen elsewhere, and there's nothing going to stop it unless people realize the facts for what they are and take the kind of action that needs to be taken. I only wish the Islamic persecution of Christians and Jews and of moderate Muslims would get the same amount of media attention as this episode in New Zealand is getting. Now, I like New Zealand. I like the Kiwi people. There are many fine believers in New Zealand. I do not like to see any nation scarred by violence. But it's not just New Zealand. It's going to become inevitable. We must make a distinction between moderate Muslims and extreme ones. Otherwise, people are going to put them all in one basket and be driven to an extreme position to defend their countries because their governments won't. There are cities in Great Britain where British people can't walk down the street, where Muslim self-appointed police are enforcing Sharia. Christians and Jews have no freedom in Muslim countries, generally speaking. Now they shouldn't have any freedom in their own either. And if you say that, they say you're committing a hate crime. No, I'm not committing a hate crime. Moderate Muslims are the first victims of the radicals. They should not be victimized. But they're going to be. More of this is coming. Mark my words. But it came this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.